All right. So welcome to Math 140, Calc 2. This is, I believe, Lecture 27, so we are now in the home stretch. We are going to have our trip to the Rare Books Library next Friday. So instead of having a physical class here, we'll go to the Rare Books Library. I will give you more information as we get closer to that. But we should be able to see your first editions of Newton's Principia, as well as a lot of other works. Uh, in my multi-viewable calculus class, we were talking about uh, old calculations and whatnot. And so, you know, I am not old enough to have actually had a slide rule myself. Let me just go to, let's see, chat said something. I'm just going to just show, show the video. So I am not old enough to have actually used this when I was a student, but I have inherited these from a bunch of engineer uh, relatives a generation above me. This is a standard slide rule. I will you bring this as well to the rear books trip. And then I actually prefer the spherical, I'm oh, sorry, the circular slide rule to the standard linear one. And if you have really good vision, you can actually do some calculations with these. I can no longer do this without my glasses on. Okay, so what are we going to be doing today? So today we're going to be continuing uh, a topic we started you know, a while ago, which is volumes of revolution. So it all comes down to you know what are the applications of calculus? You know why do we care about learning how to do integrals? Well, we we like to do integrals for a variety of reasons. The big reason they give you initially in calculus seems to be let's integrate which is not really a good explanation. So then after the day, I say, well, we like to calculate areas or volumes and you can use integration to find areas and volumes. We talked about, you know, we did the baseball lecture that you can use integration to find probabilities. And that's one of the most important applications of integrals is finding probabilities. So sometimes these probabilities are defined as your regions in space. You know, if you're in this region, something happens. If you're outside this region, something doesn't happen. And so if you can find volumes that often gives you the opportunity to find probabilities of events. So what we're going to do today is talk about a variety of ways to find volumes of different types of regions. Not surprisingly, the regions we're going to do are going to be regions that have a tremendous amount of symmetry. If you want to do a generic one, you have to take a subject called multivariable calculus, where you integrate over several variables, you know, one after the other after the other. This is a class on one variable calculus. So since it's a uh, class on one variable calculus, what we have to do is we have to do some gymnastics to reduce you know, two or three dimensional integrals down to one dimensional integrals. And the way to do this is always by exploiting symmetry. So did we do the farmer Brown problem? Oh, good. We've got the daily Java update alert. Excellent. I was wondering when we were going to get that. So did we do the farmer Brown problem? Farmer Brown loves rectangles and will not consider any other pen to hold his cows. Okay, so this is farmer Brown. And this is actually worth checking a little bit. So farmer Brown will only consider a rectangular pen to enclose his cows. And he wants the maximum possible area. Out of curiosity, does anybody know the book Click, Clack, Move? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Palmer Brown has a problem. All day long, his cows like to type click, like move, click, like move, click, like move. So this time, instead of uh, the problems with his cows, it's just that he only will consider rectangular shapes. So imagine he has, you know, two s equals, you know, he has uh, p meters of fencing, maximize the area. And so if we write down what we have, well, if you have P meters of fencing, what is the perimeter of this rectangle? It is, it's P, but how can I relate that to what I have the X and the Y? Yeah, P equals two X plus two, or X plus Y, equals p over two. And what's the area as a function of x and y? x, y. So what we want to do is we want to maximize the area, but it's a function of two variables. We only know how to maximize functions of one variable. Now in multivariable calculus, you'll learn hopefully Lagrange multiplies and you'll learn ways to do this. Right now in this class, the only way we can do this is to reduce this to a one variable problem. How can we reduce this to a one variable problem? 
Well, which would we do all in terms of x, all in terms of y? Would you solve for x in terms of y or y in terms of x? Absolutely y in terms of x. I mean, no, no one would ever do. No. It doesn't really matter which one you do, but the standard convention seems to always be solve for y in terms of x. Now, I'm going to give a new name to my function a of x because it's a function of just one variable. It's going to be x times p halves minus x. How do I find where that function is maximized? What do I do? This is a nice way to review some stuff we've been doing. This. How do you find where the function is maximized? So this is the critical point. Anything else? And endpoints, right? I don't want to crash into the door again. Right? What is the restriction on x? What are the possible values for x? How small can x be? How large can x be? Yeah, uh, not p. p divided by 2. You're basically, you could have y go all the way down to 0. 0 less than equal to x less than equal to p halves. Note a of 0 equals a of p halves equals 0. So we don't actually have to worry about the endpoints maximizing the volume because of the area, because you're going to just get a 0 area. How would you calculate a prime? How would you find the derivative of this function? How would you find in the derivative of this function? Function, how do I differentiate it? What would you do? Uh, it's not the power rule. You could use the product, but there's something better than the product rule. Who? Would, yes. Yes. Who is our favorite New England transcendentalist writer? Right? The great Henry David Thoreau. Simplify, simplify. Write this as p halves x minus x squared. A prime of x is going to be p halves minus 2x, and a double prime of x is going to just be minus two. So the critical point is x equals p over four, a triple, a double prime at p over four equals negative two. So this is a max. So you, Henry David Thoreau's famous advice, simplify, simplify. Before you start doing any calculation, C, can you spend a moment thinking about the algebra and make your life easier? I would much rather differentiate a, a, a sum or a difference than differentiate a product. So notice what we did here. We took a, a problem. There was really a problem in several variables. There was a problem in two variables. And we combined things in a nice way to make it a problem in one variable. You can often do tricks like this. But eventually, as you go further and further, it becomes harder and harder to do this. And this is one of the reasons why we have a class like multivariable calculus, to allow you to attack this as fundamentally a two-dimensional problem. But we're going to do the same thing when we're looking at a lot of these volumes of revolution. Rather than looking at it as a fundamental integral over two or three-dimensional space, we're going to reduce it to a one-dimensional integral because this is a class where we only do one dimension. Any questions on the farmer ground ball? As long as we're doing this, I want to actually talk about one of my favorite um, twists. So Farmer Bob. So Farmer Bob is very similar to Farmer Brown, except Farmer Bob, his land is right next to a giant ocean. So he does not need four sides of fencing. How many sides does he need? 
three. And so now for farmer Bob, it's going to be y, y, x. And so now it's going to be x plus 2y equals p, maximize area. Can we handle this similarly? Can we attack this problem similarly? This isn't going to be that hard. The reason I love this problem is if you look at it the right way, the problem can be solved without doing any calculus. Anybody know what the answer should be? Who knows their superheroes? Who knows who Aquaman is? I'm sorry? Okay, who's Aquaman? <laughs> okay. So roughly Aquaman, he can swim underwater, he can stay underwater as long as he needs, he can talk to the fishes. So imagine at the same time that Farmer Bob is working, Aquaman down below is working and making a pen for his fish, right? At the same time. Do you agree that whatever configuration maximizes things for Farmer Bob will also maximize things for Aquaman. So it's not like we have twice as much perimeter as before. What's the shape going to be? You know, when, we, when we did the last one, what kind of shape did we get? What kind of rectangle? If X is P over four, we didn't say this explicitly, but what would Y be? Yeah, we get square. Somebody just entered late. So we get a square. So what must be the maximum shape over here? Must be a square. So if Aquaman does at the same time, same configuration as Bob. So it's a square with perimeter 2p, so the sides are what? If it's a square with perimeter 2p, each side is p over 2. Therefore, x equals p over 2 and y equals p over 4. And you can see that p over 2 plus 2p over 4 does equal p. So what I love about this is this emphasizes the power of symmetry. And also reduce to what no, reduce to what we know. So this is an absolutely wonderful problem. We don't have to do any more calculation. And again, this is just a great way to motivate what we're going to be doing with the integrals. If I ever become royalty and I get to choose a coat of armor, I will have a hammer. I love the quote, you know, if all you have is a hammer, pretty soon every problem looks like a man. There's a lot of ways to look at this. One way is no matter what you are given, if you're really good at hammering things, you find a way to convert what you're given to a problem that you can use your hammer. A better way to look at this is go to the lane with the screwdriver. If they could have solved the problem using a screwdriver, they would have. And so you have an opportunity to make a real significant contribution if you have a different skill set than everybody else in the book. If you are one of the many trained monkeys who has the exact same skill set as everybody else, it's going to be very hard to be noticed. It's going to be very hard to make that major contribution. But if you work in a field where they don't have the same training as you, you have the opportunity of making a major contribution. You might also have more of a challenge having people understand what you're doing and convincing them that it's the right thing to do. So over here, you know, a lot of good lessons to learn. Try to reduce things to one variable, exploit symmetry, reduce to things we already know. Okay, so now let's start moving to volumes of revolution. So imagine I take a parabola. So here is y equals x squared. And I can form a paraboloid by revolving this about the y-axis. 
And so, you know, I would get your paraboloid and so on and so on. And I can ask, what is the volume of the paraboloid rotated about the y axis? What other axis could I easily rotate this about? Yeah, I could also rotate it about the x-axis. And so if you've ever seen like a parabolic mirror, you can ask me, what is the enclosed volume in a parabolic mirror? So how would I calculate this? Well, let's think back to how we did integration before. You know, if I gave you a function, here's my function, what I could do is I can chop it up into you know, you know, little rectangles like this and find the area of each rectangle and then add that all up. And you know, that Riemann sum would be the area. So it would integrate from maybe x initial to x final, and maybe it would just be f of x dx. And that would be the area. So we want to do something similar here. And what we're doing is for each value of x, we're finding the area. And so at some point x, the height here is f of x. And this area is f of x times dx. You know, dx is the infinitesimal thickness. f of x is the height. So the area of each of those rectangles is just going to be f of x dx. So if I'm evolving this about the y-axis, am I going to have x changing or am I going to have y changing? Why? So let's say we have, you know, um, go from y equals zero to y equals four. And I want to find the volume. So I'm going to integrate y goes from zero to four. Do I need to write y? Can I just go integral from zero to four? Yes, but you know, given that I have a lot of variables in play, let me just be explicit and remind myself that I'm going to be integrating with respect to y. All right, now, for fixed value of y, what can you tell me about the shape that I get at that height? It's a circle. And so if I go a small amount dy, what kind of shape do I get now? A cylinder, right? So we get cylinders or disks. Get cylinders or disks of thickness dy and radius x, right? Ah, I have y as a function of x. I need x as a function of y. Because the radius, you know, for given value of y, the radius is going to just be x. That's how far I go. So this is a particularly nice function, y equals x squared. Can you find x as a function of y? So if y equals x squared, what would x be as a function of y? Yeah. So y equals x squared. So inverting, we get x equals the square root of y. And so now I can write the radius as a function of y because I am integrating. So I could write it, you know, slowly. It's, you know, the area, the volume of a disk is going to be pi, the radius, which would be x of y squared dy, which is the integral y goes from zero to four of pi square root of y squared dy. I can pull out the pi integral from zero to four of y dy. This is not that bad of an integral to do. And so what would this integral be? What function has derivative y? y squared over two. So then it would just become pi halves y squared at zero and four 
So 16 to 8, so it should just be 8 pi. So whenever you get an answer, you should always ask, is this answer reasonable? It's a positive number. That's good. What else is good about this number? What else looks reasonable about this answer? So when you see eight pi, does any of that seem reasonable when you're doing the revolution? So we've got two pi, you know, we're doing some kind of circular object. So having a pi show up seems reasonable. If I had an E showing up, I would be a little bit concerned. But the fact that a pi shows up, that's pretty good. You could also ask, you know, what is the largest radius? The largest radius is two. And so this is contained in the cylinder of radius two. So what would be the volume of a cylinder of radius two and height four? So it would be pi, pi times r squared, so it'd be pi times four, times four is 16. So it's gotta be at most 16 pi. We've got eight pi. Yeah, that seems reasonable because I'm definitely losing a lot from the bottom. Okay, so the hardest part is sometimes inverting and finding x as a function of y. If I wanted to find the volume, if I rotated about the x-axis, this would be even easier. Your x would then go from zero to two, and then my radius now would just be y, which is given to me as a function of x. So this is all we need to do for problems like this. So this is fundamentally a multivariable calculus problem. You know, you know, if you want, you could write it as the integral over x, y, and z inside the paraboloid of the function one dx dy dz, and that will give you the volume. Or you could say, let me take a, a circle in the xy plane, and I'm going to have my height. You could do that as well. But we can play games, and we can do this as a one-dimensional integral, because we can exploit a tremendous amount of symmetry. So the key thing here is we are using the fact that we know what the volume of a cylinder or a disk is. So this is often called the disk method. And then there's a whole slew of different types of integration problems I can give you along these lines. Uh, some people, when they teach this class, they love giving you all these different types of volumes you can do. I, I will admit that there are, to me, more interesting problems to look at than finding tremendous numbers of volumes. A lot of it is you know, common sense. So I could give you maybe the following. So this way. So here is y equals the square root of x, and maybe here is y equals x squared. And I could ask if I look at the region above the y equals x squared and below y equals x. So what are the points of intersection? It's zero, zero, and what's the other point? One, one. So I could say, let me rotate this about the y-axis, or let me rotate this about the x-axis, and ask what's the region in between? Any idea how you would figure what would be the volume of the rotated region about the y-axis? Yeah, exactly. So if I want to find the volume of the region between and rotate it, just do it as a subtraction. So the volume of the revolution of the region in between the curves is obtained by subtraction.
And so what we would do is, okay, we're integrating with respect to Y or with respect to X if we're going about the Y axis. So we're going about the is y varying with x varying? Why? Right? We're rotating about the y axis, we're sweeping it around. So what's the range for y? Zero to one. So y goes from zero to one, which is going to give me the larger volume or the outside volume, the y goes x squared or the y goes squared with x. X squared. So it's going to be pi. And now what's the radius? If y goes x squared, this is the same as x equals what? Square root of y. We've done that already. So it's going to be pi square root of y squared is the outside one. For the inside one, if y equals square root of x, what is x equal as a function of y? X equals y squared. And then that's just the integral we would do. I am not particularly interested at all in what that answer is. But this is just how you would set it up. And now we can do problems like that. Okay. Any questions about this? So let's think back to the basic shapes you've hopefully done in geometry. You three dimensional shapes. You've done spheres, rectangles, cubes. What are the nice three dimensional shapes that you've done? I'm sorry? Pyramids. Although pyramids are not as nice because they have different shapes. So, what's similar to a pyramid but isn't sharp? Cone. So, does anybody remember the formula for the volume of a cone? I don't think it's four third. I think it's one third. One third base height. And when you say no, when you say pi r squared, that pi r squared is the base. So you know, this is just a question of do you explicitly say pi r squared or do you say base? Yeah. Given how you know little time we have alive, I'd rather say base. It's a little faster. Doesn't make any difference. So let's say I give you, you know, some line. And now we want to rotate this. And we want to figure out you know, what is the volume of the cone. So let's see if we can prove that it really is one third base times height. I'm going to assume that you have never proved this formula in your previous classes. Did you prove this in any of your calculus? Okay. But this is a formula you've heard. So why is the volume of a cone one third base times height? I'm sorry? But I don't see a nice way to piece it together. Anyway, it's basically saying that the volume is equivalent to a third of a cylinder. I agree with you completely. But I don't see how to just immediately look at this and see that it should be one third. I think I, I, I gotta like write it down. So you want to try to say something about somehow maybe how the line is angling and what you're getting as you rotate. But it, it doesn't, you know, you, you don't see three cones fitting together and making a cylinder. There is a way to prove this elementarily. The Greeks knew this. You know, this is not a result that had to wait for calculus. But this is a result that you've used for years without actually seeing why it's true. So we need to come up with an equation for the line. So let's choose our point. So this is going to be the point um, r comma 0. And this point over here will be 0 comma h. So the first thing is we need the equation of the line. 
So we have two points. How do you find the equation of the line going through two points? I'm sorry? Good, so let's find the slope. So the slope M is going to equal zero minus H over R minus zero is negative H over R. And now we can do point slope, which is one of my favorites. We get Y minus zero equals negative H over R um, X minus R. Or Y is equal to negative H over R X plus H. Okay, so now let's find the volume. Are we integrating with respect to X or with respect to Y? Y. So we integrate Y goes from zero and what's the maximum value of Y? H. And now we need pi X of Y squared dy, right? because the radius is going to just be x. Okay, well, so if we're seeing this way, then we say, well, actually, we don't want to write y as a function of x. What we want to do is we want to write x as a function of y. So it's going to be y minus h times negative r over h, which is going to be uh, r over h h minus y, which is going to be r minus r over h y. Ah, I just took the negative sign inside. Yeah, it really doesn't matter because I'm about to square things. So you know, this is what we get for x. So the air, so the volume is going to be y goes from zero to h of uh, and I'll write as one minus one over h y squared dy. Well, the odd the odd gets squared as we pull it out, and we have the pi. So it's going to be pi r squared integral y goes from zero to h of one minus one over h y squared dy. How can I do that integral? How would you do that integral? So you could do U substitution. How else could you do? You could assume which would you rather do, U substitution or distribute it out? So distribute, you're going to have three terms to do, but you know, I think it's less likely that you'll make a mistake. Uh, for me, if I look at this and say, oh, this looks a lot like it, if I just put in a negative one over H, then I can just integrate and get one minus one of h y cubed over three. So I'm going to just do it that way. And so I'll get negative pi r squared h integral from zero to h of one minus one over h y negative one over h dy. So this is negative pi r squared h one minus one over h y cubed over three at zero and h. Well, when y equals h, we just get zero. And when y equals zero, we get negative one third. The negatives reinforce, and we get pi r squared h over three. And so we get that the volume of a cone is one third base times. And we did this for an arbitrary line. So you could ask a lot of fun questions. You could ask, if I have a given length for the line, what angle should I put the line to maximize the volume? So what do you think that might be? Do you think it would be going straight down? Do you think it would be going straight across? So we know that it's somewhere between the two. Do you want to have more R or more H? Yeah, R is being squared. So it seems like we want more R than H. 
And the question is, how much? If you had to guess, what would you guess? Would you guess 45 for the angle? I might guess 60. What shape would 60 be? So if you if you had a 60 degree angle, what kind of well, where would you have the 60 degree angle? Coming down from the y-axis or coming up from the x-axis? Like, like, so total would be 60 degrees. Oh. Or would, would, would it be 30 degrees like this, or would it be like 60 degrees like this? Be 60 degrees like this. So it'd be like 120 degrees up top. I mean, it's one of the natural things to try is, you know, maybe 30 degrees up top, maybe 60 degrees up top. I don't think it's going to be 45. So let's try to maximize one third pi r squared h given the line has a fixed length of L. So again, this is a problem in multivariable calculus. We do not know multivariable calculus. Screw that. We can still do this as a function of one variable. So it's the line that we're, that we're rotating. Oh. And so we go, you know, here's R0, here's 0H, and here's L. So what is L in terms of R and H? Square Screw it. So instead of maximizing, instead of giving a fixed length L, we should look at a fixed length L squared. Or we should look at the square of the length. So we know H squared plus R squared is fixed. It's L squared. I see no reason to work with the square root, right? If the length is fixed, the square of the length is fixed. So let's look at the square of the length fix. Okay, so we have h squared plus r squared equals l squared. You have a 50-50 chance. Do you want to solve for r squared in terms of h? Do you want to solve for r in terms of h or h in terms of r? Remember, we're trying to maximize one third pi r squared h. Do I want to solve for r in terms of h or h in terms of r? Okay, why would I want to solve for h in terms of r? What do, we, what do we have? Look at that. We have a pi r squared h, and we have a relation involving h squared and r squared. Instead of solving for h or r, if we have h squared plus r squared, what should I solve for? Solve for r squared. Make life easy. This means r squared is L squared minus H squared. Make the algebra simple. So now we want to maximize one third pi R squared is L squared minus H squared times H. And what's the range on H? So what's the smallest h can be? What's the largest h can be? Well, we, remember the total length line has to be L. Yeah, yeah. Zero to L. You know, it's h is going to be L if we go straight down, and it's going to be zero if we go straight to the right. <clears throat> and if you look at it, we see clearly that this function that we're trying to maximize is going to be zero at the end of this. So if we call this function, say, uh, f of h, you know, f of zero equals f of h equals zero. So endpoints do not maximize. For many of these problems, when you're trying to find maximum minima, it's not going to be the endpoints that work. All right, so how would we find the derivative of this function? What would we do? Yeah, distribute, you know, Henry David Thoreau. Right. Yes, I think it still have the image saved, right? And so we'll bring Thoreau back. 
as we get f of h is one third pi l squared h minus h cubed. Really, I should define my function without the one third pi, because if I can maximize l squared minus h squared times h, I've maximized one third pi times that, but we'll just keep it. So we have f prime of h is going to be one third pi. The derivative of l squared h is just l squared. And then we get minus three h squared. So critical point has three h squared equals l squared. So h is equal to l over square root of three. Right? Or root three over three l. If you want, without loss of generality, what could we have assumed the length of the line is? One, you know, we just change units of measurement to make the length equal to one. All right, so now let's figure out. So if H is root three over three L, then R squared is L squared minus H squared. So R squared is L squared minus H squared. So that's L squared, H squared is L squared over three. So it's gonna be one third L squared, right? So R squared is going to be two thirds L squared. So R is equal to the square root of two thirds L. Did I do the algebra correctly? Your h squared is just, you know, my, my units look right. And you can check and see that h squared plus r squared, it's gonna be one third l squared plus two thirds l squared is going to just be l squared. You look, I did, did I make an algebra mistake? Okay, so now let's see what kind of triangle we get. So this would be L, I would be root two thirds times L, and this would be um, root three over three L. So if I call this angle theta down here, Okay. So how would I figure out what angle that is? Or do you want to do the angle from the top? Which angle do you want? We can make this angle up top be phi. We can calculate either. Do we want phi or do we want theta? Phi. All right, so let's do phi. So how would you figure out what phi is? So give me a relationship that would allow me to find phi. So we know that we need to know phi. So given, given that I have this triangle, how can I find phi? I have to use some trigonometry knowledge. I can use anything. I can use tangent, I can use sine, I can use cosine. You know, it's which function do you want to use the inverse of? I'm, I'm going to use Mathematica, so it's not a big deal for me, right? I'll use tangent. So tangent of phi is equal to opposite over adjacent. So it's root two over three divided by the square root of one over three. So it's equal to root two. So phi is arctangent of root two.
And so this is approximately 0.9555. So, so our tangent of two is not one of the nice guys, unfortunately. So if I want, how would I convert this to an angle? This is radians. How do I get from radians to an angle? So how many radians are there in a whole circle? Two pi. So just we had P was approximately 0.955317. Two pi radians equals 360 degrees. So it's always good to put in units of measurement. So this basically phi is about 0.955317 radians. So what do I have to multiply by to end up with something in degrees? 180 over pi or 360 over two pi, 360 degrees over two pi radians. So go back over here and I multiply by 360 divided by 2 pi. I get this is about 54.73. So 2 phi would be approximately 1. About 109.471. idea if this, this has any meaning. Yeah, okay. The angle in, in water between hydrogen and oxygen is 140 degrees. So it's obviously not the same angle as that. But you know, it, it's interesting to think about you know, what is the right angle. If this is you know, 54, then since it has to add up, the other one is going to be around 36. I'm just trying to figure out what is the relationship between the two. It turns out it's not one of the nice triangles you want because of the way the relationships go. So it's a nice homework problem. Try to find what would be the volume of the sphere if you know what the volume, or if you know what the you know, area of the circle and distance. So see if you can figure out the form of the volume of the sphere. All right, this is a good place to stop. Have a great rest of the